subscribe. So, alright, please smile again. Alright, um, confirming all of us can see the live tab. Alright, perfect. We'll uh, give it a minute to start with our discussion, but after you please go on what you were talking about. Yeah, so we are, we are trying to um, disrupt that distribution, which currently happens through social media right from your bank. So we are looking at uh, not only providing the distribution of, so for example, um, say if you want to buy an organic olive oil, bank is not the first place point of call. So we are trying to create that distribution from your banking ecosystem because banks not only understand who you are, but we can also provide you with credit to reconcile what you want to buy without any friction. All right, gentlemen, uh, we have attendees joining us now. So let us be polite to them and uh, start talking about the, the, the discussion that they've actually come in for. Um, I'm going to start uh, in three, two and one and let's launch. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning and good night, whichever part of the world you are in. And I'm sure you're in different parts of the world. Uh, welcome to this very interesting panel discussion towards the uh, tailing end of this very interesting Horasis Extraordinary Meeting on the USA. And this panel is on how to lead when the global trust is stumbling. I'm very lucky that we have an all-star group of panelists over here. I start with Stephen Hurth. Stephen, of course, is the principal for Stephen Hurth and Associates. He has literally decades of experience in family office, investment banking, merchant banking, so and so forth. He is in the Big Apple in New York, and I'm sure he gets his own context uh, uh, and his very unique uh, ideation when we'll be interacting with him. We then have Archie. Archie, of course, is an entrepreneur par excellence. He is just now been launching. We were discussing that just when we started a very, very interesting bank called Cogni, which is changing the paradigms of digital interactions. And then, of course, I have Calvin over here. Uh, Calvin, of course, is with Paul and Associates based out of Toronto with the big yellow duck over there, among other things. You know, there are a lot of other stuff over there, too. All right? And he's going to bring us very, very interesting from a legal uh, perspective. We are hoping that our friend Adil Thakliyal from, from New Zealand can join us soon. We're waiting for him to join us. And when he does, we'll take discussion forward. Anil, of course, brings his own very unique brand of interaction from the mental perception. Take it forward from there. Uh, before we start, Archie, could you just put yourself on mute, please? There's some echo coming in, if it's possible. Thank you so much. All right. Now, let's start. All right. And, well, let's, let's face it. This pandemic is something which none of us have seen before in our lifetimes. And I hope none of us will have to see again in our lifetimes. It's been something which has been, which is a once in a hundred year event. It's been called a black swan event. But what does it actually mean for those of us who are leaders in the world? And by leaders, I mean those of us who are leading corporations, leading organizations. All right. The public's level of distrust, it said, for CEOs and corporate leaders has not been ever lower. And I think that's which is forcing CEOs and corporate leaders to rethink how they work, how they think, how they interact, and how the dynamics are both with internal and external stakeholders. We're already seeing a change from shareholder management and share, making your shareholders happy to making all the stakeholders happy. But who are these stakeholders? And how is it that U.S. corporate leaders can make sure that in the coming years, which is going to be so volatile, so unpredictable, you can actually go forth and make sure that you can get the best out of your people. And in this world, when it comes to financial services, when it comes to business, when it comes to any human interaction, the bedrock, of course, is going to be global trust. So I'm going to throw in the first question on this. And I'm going to request each of our panelists to then actually give an introduction, of course, and go forth and talk about themselves. And let me start first with my introduction. My name is Professor Aditya Singh. I'm a director of the Athena School of Management based in Bombay. And I'm passionate about entrepreneurship, strategic thinking, leadership, and off late, digital transformation. It is my belief that if we are going to go forth in this world, we have to look at four basic you know, avenues of growth, which is impact leadership, stakeholder management, uh, circularity and sustainability and internationalization and globalization. So that's about me. Let's start with my first question to this August panel over here. How do the U.S. and global CEOs rank the pleas for aid and help from subordinates, from clients, charities and external stakeholders? Stephen, we start with you. Thank you very much. Adich. It's a pleasure to be with you and the August members here. Archie and Calvin, and greetings to everyone from the Big Apple. It's uh, 
Although spring is only a couple of days away here, we were expecting snow uh, today. I think it's, it was supposed to come today and tomorrow. Hopefully it'll pass us by and we'll have warm weather and a lot more to embrace. We're almost out of uh, this long tunnel. And I'm very proud to say that tomorrow I get my vaccination. So I'm very excited about that. I'll tell you a little bit about myself and then I'll tie it into how I apply it to the businesses. So my raison d'etre is to have a positive impact every day on at least four people around the world. And I achieve this using my own single family office, my family foundation, and a European style merchant bank where my tagline is I'm the financial Sherpa, Shaman, and Shatkin to companies all over the world. We bring our human capital, our financial capital, our strategic skill sets, and also our global networks and our relationships to the firms in which we invest. And because I've had the privilege to be educated, not only academically in the United States, but also in Europe and work throughout Europe and the Middle East and North America and Southeast Asia, my perspectives on leadership and on business and particularly dealing with entrepreneurs and families are very different, I think, than most Americans. And when we talk about leadership, I wanted to do a little bit of research because I get inundated like many people do on attending this webinar or this course. So we did a quick search. Alone on Amazon, there are over 60,000 books on leadership. And then we did, I wanted to go deeper and see how many classes are there. And we found out that when we did a Google's results, I want to ask my panelists, do you take a guess in 40, in under 40 seconds or about 40 seconds, how many leadership classes are there, do you think? Can anyone have a guess? 20,000. Eight, 800 million. Oh, I guess that was close. Yeah, yeah, yeah on, on leadership. This is absolutely extraordinary. Since the beginning of time, whether regardless of your religious beliefs or persuasion from the religious aspects, from the spiritual side of things to academic history, people are always saying, talk about leadership. There is, in my opinion, there is no one type of leadership. And one of the problems that I find with leadership, and I'm going to say this both from, and I'm a very proud, originally Connecticut Yankee, and now make New York my home, from the American perspective and from the American corporate perspective as well as from the business perspective, too many people, the men and women in supposed leadership positions get too detached. It's very easy to send out a blast email. It's very easy to do a variety of things. You get on, you know, because of the pandemic, we've all learned about Zoom, Skype, Team, WhatsApp, you know, Telegram, all these different ones. But what we're not doing is we're forgetting the connectivity to people. We actually have a lot of people in the United States who don't have internet connectivity. This is the United States of America. We're not, yes, some people will say, may joke about us and say, we're sometimes acting like a banana republic or a developing country. I accept the jokes. But we don't have people coming down from the ivory castles, the ivory towers. And I'm going to cite two examples. One of my nephews, I call him, is um, the honorary uncle. He's working at a very large U.S. corporation, and all of you know the name of the company. So he was just hired. He went and watched, I don't know, a half an hour, 45-minute video, however long it was. Here's what you do, da-da-da-da-da, et cetera. He goes and he starts working, and he starts doing this. His colleagues and his boss say, what are you doing? He says, this is what they told us in the video. They said, we don't do that. So now you're giving someone who's just starting out a new company a mixed message. The head office is saying, these are the SOPs. You do this. These are the standard operating procedures. One, two, three, and four. And then you have the people on the front line saying, forget one, two, three, and four. Maybe we'll do four once in a while. So you have confusion. And that confusion spills over to the consumer as well. And that becomes a huge problem. The other thing is now from a political side, 
if you look at, and I'm going way back for this, and I'm sure there are other examples, but these are just two that come to mind. After the blitz of uh, London during World War II, members of the royal family left the castle, wherever they were, and they were photographed in the streets of London, destroyed London. They made themselves physically accountable. And in my family, one of the key words that was ingrained in me is accountability. The other one is responsibility. Accountability means showing up. And this is, I think, a main thing for leadership. A lot of corporate leaders in America and a lot of political leaders in America don't show up. They stay amongst their peers and they don't go down and to really chat with people. When I, and I'm going to make this final comment here. When I was 12 years of age, I went with my father to Washington, D.C. He was very well known in the U.S. agricultural community, and he was testifying before the Senate Agricultural Committee. And I was 12 years of age, and he had a cocktail party with his friends the night before they were testifying. And I ended up meeting many senators, and some of them are very famous uh, national, internationally. It was Senator Kennedy, Senator Dodd, Senator Alan Cranston, Strom Thurmond, Senator Jesse Helms, and Orrin Hatch, three ardent liberals and three ardent conservatives. And the point of the story is my father afterwards, he was a very tough man. He looked and acted like Joseph Stalin and his family and at the business. I said to him, how did it go? He said, it wasn't what I wanted and it was fair. These men compromised. And I know for a fact that at one point, I don't remember if it was Senator Strom Thurmond or Jesse Helms, came up to Connecticut and visited the New England states to actually understand, and he had some of his people with it, what's going on in New England and dealing with the ag. He made himself present and accountable. We don't see that anymore. And I think for leadership today, it has to be a physical presence. It has to be going down and being genuine. Thanks, Stephen. And I think, I think uh, those are very, very profound words, especially in the end about being physical and genuine. And I think that's something which I think a lot of us have to realize. But I would love to uh, you know, see the viewpoint, perhaps from a different angle, and that's Archie who's leading the forefront and the leading the charge in the world of, of the digital space. So, so what's, what's your uh, you know, take on this entire perspective which is happening in the world right now? I mean, from my perspective as a CEO of a company, you know, leading a startup is hard. <laughs> it's really, really hard. And you know, most founders don't come up with years of leadership experience and all of a sudden you have an investor's money and you'll have to build a team and you start scaling quite quickly. And I do believe that um, a success, a leadership skills are, 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 have a direct link for the success and outcome of your company as well. And, you know, I think it also requires for you to be a manager and, and many a times to be a leader during crisis, especially during a time in the last year or so, is many a time is to define and check strategy. Why are these people following you? Why do these people have to quit? big jobs and come follow, follow your dreams is to recalibrate and, and redefine the strategy of the company, which is basically a vision. People, most founders talk about the vision, which is the blue ocean. Uh, but what they don't talk about is the strategy to achieve the vision. So many a times as a founder of a startup, that clarity doesn't exist. And I sometimes have learned it the hard way, right? I didn't come with years of experience running uh, corporations and I've had my own trial and error as a young CEO raising capital. And for me, defining and rechecking that strategy has been very important. And also many a time would be to, you know, recruit and, and, and verify the right team. So many a times I've seen, especially, uh, you know, people come with different aspirations with a startup, right? They come in for the glory of the stock and, and multiple valuations. And having to have the right team and the right people on the right seats will, will help you to be successful. So that recruitment period is very, very important as 
we have seen that happen. Most of the recruitment, especially in the tech industry, has been happening during Zoom. Normally, when I hire people, um, I get to know them a little bit. I, I try to walk with them a mile, but you just can't do that anymore. And still, I've made mistakes in hiring sometimes the wrong people, but you make those mistakes and you learn on. But for us as a CEO, as a tech CEO, especially when things people are working from home, I had to recalibrate as to how am I going to hire these people? What do I look for? Uh, what is the EQ that I look for in these people to lead those teams and them, uh, you know, hiring more people to 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 force multiply their 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 independent area of expertise that they're working on. So that has always been very important to me. And culture, right? So as as a startup, your culture could be fast and, and quick. Let's break things and let's let's tread the gray line. And 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 and, and I'm, I'm 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 all in for that, right? And we got to disrupt, break things, and and that's how you bring really smart people on board. Um, and and many times, my my dad used to say that it's the gray line is always a it's just a it's just a smart excuse for doing something not right <laughs> right um and, and 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 startups have treading that very fine line between brilliance and stupidity many a times as well for us is to uh as a ceo is to calibrate that culture and what is acceptable and what is a no go making that very clear to the people who 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 are employed in your business has been very important especially in a time like this you know what is that you're going to tolerate what the gray area what is a no go zone so many a times especially in during the covid world when everyone's working remote you see a lot of times that happen where people tread the wrong line and then they get fired or things go very sour so that's always been um a, a very important thing for me as a startup ceo and the most important thing as a leader is to monitor progress and many a time so it kind of like goes in a full circle so you establish a strategy hire the right people and and create that um uh, set and change goals and then you assist many a time uh where they can and then monitor the progress so i had one of my colleagues he was trying to make a change uh with the now product and he had to send it to the compliance to get this ticked off um the compliance just said oh no we don't like it right and then he came up to me and said well compliance doesn't like whatever i do uh i said to him like have you spoken to them and and he goes no i sent them an email i said no don't send them an email get a zoom call have a chat hear them out here what the, everyone needs a voice and they're saying just don't 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 kind of exert your authority hear them out and he heard them out and he put his question across and when he sent the same email again this time the compliance agreed to that because they actually saw his point of view and they feel they've heard it and they felt they can work with with what he has said and there's a different angle to where he's coming from and not the angle that they were thinking it was going into so many a times especially during whether you know during zoom conversations i think we are, we are trying to send a lot of stuff on emails um face to face conversation and having that uh empathy it really works uh because as a as a startup ceo my my biggest asset is my team um and i have to always keep them motivated and 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 ask them to follow in those dark path that there is a bright light that they all going to make a lot of money and no one knows the right answer for it and there is no memo that i could pass along or or take success from reading a book so it's basically trial and error but it all comes back to the fundamental basics of hearing out people and 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 showing empathy and and monitoring progress and making sure that there's a clear line between brilliance and stupidity and you define that line very clearly from very start but as i said i didn't learn it from day one i've been perfecting that as a as a founder uh i've had my own um issues but which we have cleared and we built upon it but i think i think it's been like throwing in the deep end um and all of a sudden once you start raising capital you and making sure that you can channel that uh their their skills into a much much productive way than you know trying to kind of say I'm bigger than you you're bigger than me kind of stuff so good goes back into the
fundamentals of restating the vision and, 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 and also making sure the strategy to achieve the vision and then hiring the right people on the right seats and building up the culture where you define what's acceptable and what's not and assist where you can and then monitor the progress. It's, just, it's a very simple circle that I use um, to do it. So that's just, uh, that's what I've been doing during COVID. Thanks, Utan Archie. And, 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 and I think we all hear you that hearing is so important that in a world where a lot of that noise is about getting your opinion across, being able to tell people what you want, what you like, how you want. I think you're very correct. Sometimes just sitting face to face across with each other, asking people their viewpoint, listening to them, making them feel that you actually give credence to what they're talking about can make all the difference between success and Um, I work for for a firm called Kroll. Uh, we've uh, been around uh, as a firm since the 1970s. We're sort of a corporate investigations and intelligence firm. Um, I I have the, the the business intelligence group of the firm here in Toronto. Uh, I've been at the firm for about 14 years now. So uh, I sort of started, uh, you know, right at the bottom and kind of have moved up over the years. I've, I've worked at the firm in Asia uh, and was hired in London. And and I sort of spent you know time in different offices and uh, and also in different leadership cultures really and 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 also as time has gone by sort of seen how the focus of what we do has also moved a bit from you know being in consulting means that you're always you know regardless of where you sit in the totem pole you're always looking at numbers and targets and hitting them and being utilized and making sure the client's happy and. And things like that, and you're always kind of, you know, looking at deadlines. I think a lot of the times in the past, I feel, uh, you know, a, a number of firms basically and a number of kind of leaders just looked at their people very much like units of productivity, where you know you you basically kind of did work and sort of you know hit targets, and nobody really cared about the things that say Archie or Stephen talked about about empathy or communication or or how motivated people actually feel. I think. Especially, I mean, I'm happy to sort of, you know, say that, you know, I work at a firm which, which, which has focused very much and particularly in, in the COVID age of sort of pivoting very much to, to the way the world, way the world is moving and the, on the way a lot of, you know, younger people who don't necessarily have the same kind of gray area corporate mindset of the 1980s or 1990s, for example, think. And I think three of the main, well, I mean, I, I would probably, talk about a number of different things here, but I think three of the main sort of areas in which I think leadership and trust is built is definitely communication, how you communicate, you know, whether it's, I mean, you don't often have the chance these days to, uh, I mean, here in Toronto, we've been locked down for, I mean, for, <laughs> for the last six months, feels like the last six years, but you don't often have the chance to actually meet in person. So how you communicate remotely, whether it's verbally, on the telephone, on Zoom, things like culture, what a company actually sees as being important i mean i think everyone's aware that when you know regardless of where you are at a firm that there are certain kind of targets you need to meet there are certain numbers and things like that but i think more so what do you think as a firm about things like inclusion diversity mental health how you actually treat your employees um is is very important and then finally i think a, a lot of firms have sort of accepted that we aren't really going back necessarily to the idea that everybody commutes, you know, to an office building on a crowded train or bus or anything into the central, you know, into the center of their city where you basically need to watch them from nine to five to make sure that they're, you know, they're, they're FaceTime and, you know, and completely functional. So how you pivot towards being very accepting to either remote working or a flex model, especially as a big established firm, or as an established company is really important. Um, I think one of the, the amusing things from last year was uh, various firms, I know, did these surveys to get a pulse of how their employees felt or how people felt. And so, you know, you had everyone basically asking you how you felt, what you thought about remote working, things like that. And then everyone basically gave their opinions. 
and they might have ran contrary to what certain people thought people should be thinking. And they were like, okay, time to just junk all these surveys. Um, so I think, you know, just, I mean, as Archie just pointed out a few minutes ago, I think, you know, like empathy is just a quality, I think just globally, whether it's, you know, in the corporate world or even politically or, or even in conversations is just something that's so important. Um, so those are kind of my main sort of initial thoughts on the matter. Thank you so much, Calvin. Uh, uh, one of the major things which has happened, of course, is a lot of organizations have, have been working from home for the past year. I mean, I know for sure in India, it's been exactly one year since a lot of, you know, uh, being from the education sector, a lot of institutions shut down. And I remember what we told our students, three weeks, give us three weeks and you're going to be back in campus. And I read this, uh, this meme, uh, meme on, on the internet. They said, uh, you know, my college told me that we're going to be back in three weeks and now I'm an alumni. All right. and, and that's actually what gives a context about what's happening. Um, and, and that comes with its own unique uh, challenges. How do you actually build this entire ecosystem of trust, mental happiness and togetherness in a situation where you're actually not meeting people physically? You don't have an office where you actually assemble to tig- together. And in many ways, you, you don't have a physical space for cohesiveness. So from that context, how is it that you can actually create or is there a way of creating a new structure or a new mode of getting cohesive organizations together? And I'd like to also add something which our friend, uh, you know, uh, Anil had talked about is what are the entire the, the, the mental and psychological aspects of this? Is there an additional stress factor? How do you actually vent? How do you you don't actually have that coffee corner anymore where you talk over the coffee and talk about this person and that person, and this problem. So how do you do that? And where does the leader come from there? I would love to get input from, from any of you and go in any order you wish to now. It's open season. I have, I have a di- I hear what you're saying, Deetra. I have a different perspective. And I'm an eternal optimist. The, we're going to have the, this virus with us for years to come. But we have a vaccine now and we'll have other vaccines. The same way, at least in the United States, you get a flu vaccine every year or so we'll get, we'll adapt. We're going to be, we will be getting more connected again. And there's a song that I remember from a childhood movie, Dr. Doolittle, where it says, if I could talk to the animals, learn the language, what a great achievement it would be, chatting with a cheetah, etc. We are all mammals. We are all mammals. Whether we speak English, Hindi, German, Polish, it doesn't matter. We all have our own languages. We're going to get back. We will get out there. The mental health issue, it's too early to tell. You know, you're going, I personally know in my circles, several people have gotten divorced or filing for divorce. We have in the New York City area, gradually, people are starting to report spousal abuse, parental abuse, all these other, their physical and mental. We, we literally had, for example, uh, a 10 year old boy killed the other week uh, from abuse. And there's a hospital here. It's the first hospital in the country that, that set up last May. It was May or June. Uh, and, uh, a mental health center to address the needs first of the doctors and the nurses and the first responders because of the shock. And they're gradually rolling this out across the country. I say this because we're coming out of this. We're going to, I think what we're going to have to learn, and I give Archie credit. Archie and I don't know one another. We just met. There are a lot of people that I know who won't say pick up the phone. I think there's a few few weeks difference in age between Archie's birth date and mine. And a lot of the people that I know of his generation will text. They'll do other things. They won't physically get together. Uh, dating, I don't know how many new dating apps, it's Hinge, there's Bumble, there's this, uh, Tinder, all these other. It doesn't matter. We need to get out. How we're going to get out, I think that gets back to, as everyone on the panel has said, account of uh, communication, but also physically present. We're starving. Most people are starving to get out there. The other thing is, and I'm going to go back to the, the opening, where you said, is global trust uh, crumbling. 
From the U.S. perspective, for the last few administ- couple of administrations at least, I think we are redefining, does America have to be the global leader? Is that, a, do we really want to be the global leader? And do we have, and that impacts how our companies react, how our people react. Now it's, as I said, I've traveled so much. A great job of it. Now, other times we messed it up royally. And it goes back to what Archie said the communication, but I'm going to succinctly now state we're out of the pandemic for the most part. We have solutions, we have vaccines, we're getting better. We need to first be true to ourselves before we can go out and start being true to others. And Archie has his own business. Calvin works for a very well respected. It was a family business. It's now one of the leaders in its field globally. And I'm not giving, they trust it. The name Kroll means trust. But that took so long to build up. I don't know how long it's going to take for Archie's group to develop also to the outside world that trust. I just don't know. And what it's going to take to do it. I I, um, I just want to do a follow on from actually one, one of Stephen's points here. I think, you know, as much as we are and, and I, I, you know, I totally agree that, you know, remote working and hybrid workings, you know, is important and we fit that in, into these models. I think, you know, we are all craving more human interaction. And I think, you know, there is definitely something to be said. I mean, it, it isn't necessarily a cliche to say that, you know, an accidental meeting or running into someone, uh, you know, without you know which isn't going to happen on zoom is so important to to relationship building and to even trust building i think it's a lot easier to kind of work and manage people who you actually know or have known in person i mean which is why i sort of you know i I find it amazing that you know like how arch pointed out about you know being able you know having recruiting people over zoom when you're not actually able to kind of physically get a sense of body language in the same way or sit with them in the same room um so i mean i guess in 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 sort of a, a broader way i guess to answer your original question this year i think you know th- there is no one solution because we're all in such different places we don't actually know whether we'll be sitting here in march next year 2022 having another virtual conversation uh, or not but yeah If I, that we, uh, that we have an address, uh, Archie. give me our two. Yeah, so for me, um, you know, being a, again, I, I can only speak from my experience is being a startup founder. It's always very lonely at the top, you know, and, and for me, you know, when we, when there was a thought about how, how do you engage with people? How do you, uh, how do you stay sane and how do you s- uh, stay mentally more effective to to execute what you are doing in your day to day job. For me, I lean on my board. I lean on on my all my investors. Right? It's it's their problem too. <laughs> For me to 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 do to do well. So uh, uh, thankfully, all my investors have been quite very supportive uh, during some of the most toughest of time. Uh, my team has been very supportive. So when we we were in the middle of our Series A race last year, and COVID hit, we couldn't do face to face meetings, and we had to now extend our runway. And I had COVID in March, and I was out of action for two months. And it was kind of a massive. It was like in the middle of Series A, you're supposed to raise funding. Or you're going to go out of business in three and a half, four months time. And you have COVID, you're out out of action in New York. And New York was ground zero. Um, And and looking through my window on the west side, I could actually see the ship coming in, the hospital ship. It was not a pleasant scene, right? And I can tell you that, you know, my board member was on the phone trying to make sure that I get checked up and things were happening. Uh, My team took 
hold of the entire company because I couldn't stay on the calls. I was running very high fever. And what kind of really worked was the first, the top level leadership that I built really stood up, stepped up during the time of need. And they were actually uh, telling me to just, hey, take it easy. You don't worry about it. Um, you know, and, and then we decided, you know, we're not going to let, we're not going to let anybody go. So we have a customer service team in Long Island and, you know, people who work in customer service, um, don't get paid a lot and they come from <clears throat> different diverse, diverse backgrounds as well. And they are the hardest hit because obviously the leadership, um, uh, I mean, no, I mean, I can't blame the leadership as well, uh, for a fact that because nobody planned for this, nobody expected this. Um, and, and one of the things that the top leadership did was they initiated a uh, 30% pay cut for everyone at the very top and made sure that we don't reduce the pay cut at the bottom to extend our runway. Right. And the engineers said, okay, we're not going to spend anything more in creating new stuff, but instead they ended up launching in Puerto Rico, became the first digital bank to launch in Puerto Rico. And all these was done in a very minimalistic cost. And I was very proud that uh, the team that we built during, you know, previously was able to sustain us for the, you know, the, the six months of the most insane time. And then we ended up raising close to another $5 million at a 15% discount to CDSA because on the way that we innovated during the toughest of time and how people supported each other and how they brought me back into the business, right? They made me feel that I'm ready to lead this company again. And we did have some attrition as well, right? We did have some attrition towards the very end because we didn't know where the business was going to go because it was a, it was a very tough time. It took us a while to stabilize the company. But for me, during um, establishing that trust uh, with my investors early on, establishing that relationship with my advisors early on, was it was, it was actually very helpful that they actually came through during the time of my need. And some of my team came through at the time of my need, made tough decisions, which I was not mentally ready to make those decisions myself because you didn't know what's right and what's wrong and everything that you do has consequences as well. So this kind of made us really resilient as a business. And now when we are oversubscribed in our series A right now, and I, I would, when I reflect back and look at my team and I, 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 I say to them that, Hey, you know, we, we've been through the toughest. We've been through the most insane path and we came through. We never let anybody grow, anybody go. We grew our business we optimized our finances, and now we have seen it all. And we have a framework to handle during crisis. We know things that worked and things that did not work. And so this ecosystem provided me, um, um, you know, a, a good feedback loop um, in, 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 in trying to figure out where I'm going to take this business and who stepped up, who did not step up, and, 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 and how we can model moving forward. Because as a company, you're moving away from being a village to a small town and small town to a city. And, you know, every time there's new people coming in and you are passing on your values to, to, the, to the next uh, group of people. Well, there will be people who leave because they might not agree for the, the, the steps that you're taking, but that is okay, right? It is okay that they don't accept your vision. And I used to be kind of guy that used to say, like, I don't like to let anybody go. Right. And and for me, you know, establishing that trust with my top leadership team and my advisors gave me the thing. It's OK to let people go if they do not agree to the vision and you be direct about it. You earn that trust by being having a direct communication with them as well. So that communication, establishing that communication <laughs> sorry, across across the ecosystem helped me sustain during during the toughest of my time. But as I said, this is just, you know, what, what I did might not work for other people, but this is personally, this is what worked for me. And some of them was not pre-planned. Uh, some of them just happened because there was a few things that was done right when we didn't even know those things were done right. So, so that's how I see it. Um, I'm still in a learning process as a, as a young CEO, and, and I don't have the experience that Stephen has or... Uh, or, or Kelvin has with big organizations. So I am, I'm learning on the go. Uh, and, and, the, and for me, the best learning is basically to talk to people and people who are involved with your ecosystem and, 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 and not act like you know it all. So that's from us. <laughs>
if I can chime in, I want to compliment on something, but there's something else that's about learning. And I'll tell you one of the things that I learned a long time ago, but I observe. People have to start to embrace that leadership is also not just from, you know, men of a certain age. We have to realize the strength of the leadership of women and of minorities in this country and in other places. And I was naive. I'm going to say this right. I, because I was raised in a way where women can do many things. I can't, to, in, the point that I'm going to drive here is I'm still amazed in this very liberal city of New York and in other cities and towns around the world that there are people in meetings. I've seen the physical language. If they see a woman coming in to lead something, if they see a non-Caucasian, if they see someone of a certain age, their body language tunes out and they shut down. And that is a detriment to the future of us all. Until we become more self-aware and comfortable to say, okay, I'll listen to you. I may not agree with you, but at least I'll be open to listen to you. That is really, it's going to take us a long time together. We need to have, in my opinion, I don't care, as long as you're qualified, you're a man, you're a woman, you're from Sri Lanka or you're from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. You can do the job. You have the ethics. That's the leader. That's a type of leader or someone to come into a leadership position. And that needs to, I think, be addressed not only in the U.S., but in many countries around the world. We have to start breaking down that barrier to allow more people, regardless of age, regardless of sex, sexual orientation, if they're good, if they have, can deliver as Archie wants to seem to deliver, let them lead, let them be empowered, let them do it. Thanks, Stephen. Calvin, we have about three minutes on the clock, so I would request Calvin to perhaps uh, uh, you know, um, give final statements for the next two minutes, and then I'll allow all of you to give me my 30 seconds of glory towards the end, please. Thank you. Uh, I mean, it, it's great because we have, you know, such different experiences on this panel and, and you know, the, the, the diversity that Stephen just talked about as well is, is sort of reflected in, in all of our experiences and views on, on this issue. I think, uh, you know, we, we are very much, you know, in the midst of sort of, you know, a big change in the way work and life is being conducted. And I think just you know, one of the areas that I sort of, you know, that we glazed over uh, on this panel was, you know, about trust sort of in, in even like a global and leadership stance from a political point of view. And I think, um, you know, going back to some of the things we talked about, I feel that in this age where everything's so instant and so quick, we tend to always find disagreements with people we we tend not to build common ground you know someone posts a comment online and then you have 20 people kind of attacking them i feel like you know back to some of the things we started with here like empathy communication you know being open to like inclusion and diversity i think all those things as the world kind of moves forward and 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 you know as as we you know as we work both remotely and in person uh i hope contributes to sort of more you know more trust building uh, and, you know, better communication going forward. Thank you, Calvin. Uh, we have one minute on the clock. So I think I'll sum this up uh, with all your permissions by saying I think what comes across is that old adage where uh, uh, the more things change, uh, the more they remain the same, isn't it, in the end? And uh, in the end, trust is all about a cocktail of decency, open communication, feedback, and listening to the other person when they're speaking and in some ways, be empathetic. All right. I, I think I, that's I, very I, I have, I have one, uh, but Archie, I'll give you a word in. Don't worry. I know you're waiting. So the, I'll let the final word in go with Archie. He's the young founder, so we'll give him that space. All right. Go for it, Archie. For me, one thing that always resonated with me the most is the delegation of authority is a real movement of truth. That's what 